If you've recently experienced a death in the family, this might be a sensitive episode. Join us today on Becoming Branches as we dive deep in what the world is like as a mortician with Greg Huffman on this week of Becoming Branches. Come on in. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Becoming Branches. My name's Adam Cook. To my right, Pastor Dustin McKinney and our very special guest. And you guys can't see his hoodie, but I got to give a shout out. Last responder, Greg Huffman. We're going to get into that and what that means on this week of Becoming Branches. So thank you so much for being our guest. Mm -hmm. What questions do you have for a man who's seen some pretty gnarly things? I have so many questions, and I know we have a limited time. So so for for those of you who don't know, so Greg has spent his life as a mortician. Uh, Now he is a semi-retired funeral director. So first of all, how does someone find themselves in this line of work? And you specifically, how did you you become a mortician? Uh, Okay. I was 16 years old, I was mowing yards in my neighborhood, and one of the men whose yard I mowed died. And this was up in Anderson, Indiana, small town. My dad was fairly well known, we were upper middle class, he was guide lamp and a mason, and I walked into the funeral home to pay my respects, and the owner of the funeral home who knew my dad shook my hand and said, would you like a job? And he said, come back, talk to us after you get out of school. I'm a junior in high school. Yeah. And I come back up there, and the next thing I know, I'm working every other night and every other weekend for the rest of my life. Um, and that's staying all night at the funeral home and then getting up, going home, taking a shower, going to school, and then being off the next day. And, and, th- and that's what you did. Now, hmm. Things have changed since then because... A lots of, have changed in, in a lot of different industries, but people don't stay all night anymore mm-hmm. most of the time. But anyway, that was my life for you know the first thirteen years of my working yeah. career was doing that, and that, you know it, it was, so it wasn't something I actually picked to do. Right. So 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 nothing drew you into the job. You just kind of fell into it. You're just yeah. hey, I don't have a job. Yeah. This, I, now I have a job. Yeah. So when you first went in, like. Because I know for, for some people, like just being around anyth- anything dead, right, it just freaks them out. They don't want any part of it. So did you have any of that hesitation like going in? Like was there anything that kind of freaked you out at first and you had to kind of work to get over it? Well, it wouldn't have freaked me out, but you have adult funeral directors who were going to make sure that you were freaked out. Uh, purposely. You know, purposely. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, they would be our dorm room was because you know, we, we had beds and you stayed all night, you know, and, and you went on a call with a funeral director. If somebody happened to pass away in the middle of the night, you were going to get up at two or three o'clock in the morning, go to with the funeral director who was there and go. Well, the preparation room was right above our dorm. And so you would hear things drop on the floor or you know, all these things. And they thought that's cute. I'm just wanting to go back to sleep because I got school the next day. You know, yeah. when I was in a college prep class and had, you know, things that I needed to study for and I go to anyway. So, but otherwise, no, I think it just happened so quick that I didn't even think about what I was doing because it wasn't something it wasn't my, you know, my parents, nobody that in my family was ever in the funeral business. So it wasn't something I was ever around. But all of a sudden, it just sort of dropped in my lap. And um, and I would say, looking back now, it was God-ordained. Because mm-hmm. it was not something that like I would have done. Mm-hmm. But it was comfortable. And mm-hmm. I was good at it. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, so anyway, just telling you that, that... So it didn't really freak me out. Nothing, you know, depending on, on you know, what we were involved with, everything just seemed to be you know, flowing other than some funeral directors who wanted to make life difficult for me. Yeah, you know? sure. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Haze the rookie. Yeah. Hazing, yeah. hazing time. Yeah. yeah. The <laughs> yeah. other student who was also a junior in high school, because we, you know, we were there every other night and every other weekend. We didn't see each other during the week because we were on opposite schedules, but I knew him in high school and we could swap stories there, mm-hmm. you know, so what happened last night? What are we going to, what am I going to have to deal with tonight? 
Uh, but he did want to be in the funeral business, and okay. and so it was, you know. It did he? Was, did his family have like? Was no, that... no. It was just something he wanted to do. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And to carry that thought just a little, because you asked something about this, there are far more females getting involved in the funeral business now than there are males. It's it's. Uh, yeah, no, I think of it because you know we've had several funerals here at the church, and we usually have worked with women directors or yeah. managers and things like that. So, and by the way, because we've had a couple of funerals that you've helped with here, and you're always like mm-hmm. super professional, uh, and you do a great job. So, so I'm curious. So, like, I went to school to become a teacher, right? So there's certain like licensing credentials, you know, things that you have to go through to get that. Like, how does one become a mortician? Like, are there credentials you have to have? What does that look like? Well, again, back in 1970s, when I first started, you went to school, you had two years. You could, at, at, the, at the time that I was involved in this, there was a mortuary school at 38th and Arlington in Indianapolis. Okay. And it was a two-year program. It was really like a trade school. Yeah. They called it a college, but it really was a trade school. And you could take one year anywhere and take the second year there, or you could take both years there. And I took my first year at IUPUI, which they used to have two buildings right across from the fairgrounds. Uh, it was the Craner building and some other building. And I would drive from Indiana or Anderson every day and go down there to college and then transfer and then drive back home and work at the funeral home mm-hmm. You know, when I got back. Um, and uh, and in the second year, I was at the mortuary school, and I worked for a funeral home there in Indianapolis, and did the same kind of thing every other night, every other weekend. Mm-hmm. And um, and then once I graduated, you had to pass a national board exam. Okay. And then I moved to Florida because there's a lot of people that die in Florida. <laughs> and and that makes sense. Yes. <laughs> so are there are there like state laws yeah, that are different? Then, okay. Yeah. And then so after the first year. I went to Jacksonville, which was, and uh, took a test and got my embalmer's license. And then the second year, I got my funeral director's license. And so there's an internship program. And so you have to do so much with either embalming so many bodies or, and and then your funeral directing was to meet with so many families and and do certain things. And so then you, so there's a, on on the job training, plus there's a written exam that you have to take. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing now, except that the embalmer's license and the funeral director's license are all in one. So when you go to take your test and you pass it, it just gives you both licenses all at the same time. You don't have two separate licenses. But back then, you could be an embalmer and not be a funeral director. Or you could be a funeral director and not be an embalmer, you know, but but now it's just all one license. Yeah. You know you have an interesting, unique job when you can't get your professional license and they say, no, you haven't embalmed enough bodies yet. Yeah. That's a unique job. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so. And that's basically what happens. I mean, you, you've got students. But students generally, I, Ivy Tech has a program now. Uh, we don't have a, I don't think there is a college in Indiana anymore other than Ivy Tech. Uh, there used to be one down somewhere close to Seymour, Southern Indiana. It was Mid America College after the mortuary school in Indianapolis closed, which was like two or three years after I graduated. Then they had Mid America College, and then it went to Louisville, and there's one in Cincinnati. And mm-hmm. but anyway, you at, oh, at Ivy Tech, the uh, um, it's the same thing. You still have two years. You have to go someplace, and then mm-hmm. you hang on just a minute. Nope. Because I <laughs> that would have been a great live conversation. <laughs> like, microphone. Yeah, I go on removals. You know, I'm pretty mm-hmm. much on call now. Yeah. You know, all the time. And a removal is what? When somebody passes away mm-hmm. and you go to either the nursing home or the mm-hmm. hospital or to a residence and get them, take them into our care and, and bring them back to the funeral home and then the licensed embalmer that's there. We'll take care of you know yeah. preparation of the body, yeah. Gotcha. And and that could happen any time. Yeah. I could say no, but I don't generally, <laughs> yeah. you know, because I I really like what I do, yeah. and and I know I'm very good at it. Whether it's meeting with the nurse or the hospice nurse or whoever it is, and or or the family, if the family's still there at the nursing home or the family's still there at the hospital, and you get a chance to talk to them. And, and try to put them at ease because it's not an easy time. And, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I have so many questions, and every time you say something, I add a new question. So, like, for example, if, if foul play is expected, 
like, does your job halt until they like do their investigation and all that type of stuff? Well, yeah, because then they would call. Then either the the police or the sheriff, and in here at least, it would be Hendricks County Coroner would get involved mm -hmm. because then you know if it's something like suicide or drug overdose or something, mm. something that's not expected, yeah. you know, but sometimes with, with hospice and again, hospice was not something that was, you know, years ago, mm. but it is now. And so it's already been sort of pre-qualified that, you know, this person's going to die in the next, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And the doctor's already good with signing a death certificate. Mm. Um, so if we get a call that that's at home, then, and that's something that the, the 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 funeral home person that answers the phone is going to ask is you know who's in attendance who's going to sign the death certificate because mm -hmm. we don't have somebody that can sign a death certificate then we have to call the police mm -hmm. you know because we can't go do and we can't touch anything mm -hmm. so we are not going anywhere until we get authorization actually either from a hospice nurse or if it's at the nursing home or a hospital, it, it's automatic then. Yeah. You know, we still need a doctor that's going to sign a death certificate. That's one of the questions you're going to ask. Yeah. Um, but still, if it's the only reason this would happen would be if, if there was an unexpected death at home. Gotcha. And, and if and then you get either the sheriff or the okay. uh, you know, the plain hmm. field or, or the yeah. police or whatever, yeah. and they would make an initial investigation and if they thought they needed to go take you know the body to the coroner's office then they would do that too so the coroner does more of the investigation yeah. of the body look into the body whatever and right. you do more of this pure preparation for funeral right mm -hmm. okay gotcha. yep. i have a thousand questions so i don't want to monopolize the question so if you have one let me know <laughs> just wave your hand i'll just piggyback <laughs> off your questions perfect so you'd mentioned you'd started this in high school so I would imagine that would be like a peculiar job that someone would have in high school. Yeah. So did you ever have anyone like give you a hard time about, you know, like were you like the funeral, the funeral kid, uh, high school or any time in your life? Did you ever experience any of that? No, not really. But partly it was I was kind of an introvert, mm -hmm. you know, and so, I mean, my close friends knew what I did and it wasn't a big deal to them, yeah. you know, but most everybody else didn't know just, what I did. Okay. You know, it, it, you know so it was just. They didn't know I had a job. Most, you know, juniors in high school really don't have jobs unless it's at McDonald's or back then it was Burger Chef that we don't have anymore. But again, you all mm. probably wouldn't even know who that is. But nope. It's, yeah. It's kind of what yeah, became Hardee's. Burger Chef was in Danville here. Uh, okay. They had a Burger Chef turn it into a Hardee's. Yeah. And so, or, you yeah. know, they did have jobs like that. Maybe they worked at the hardware store or something like that, you know. But, um. You're like, oh, you flipped burgers, huh? <laughs> I flipped Phil <laughs> hey, last night. Nothing. Oh goodness! <laughs> Big old Phil, huh? Big old Phil. Another question I have. Um, so you had mentioned that you know I was thinking about your job, you know, prior to our podcast, and like when you're meeting people, you're typically meeting them in a really down part of their life, right? This is something um, that you know. For, now, not always, but I would imagine it'd be a time of great grief. So. How do you go about as far as like you have those professional lines and I can, you know, obviously you don't know, know everybody, but not to take some of that on when you're surrounded by it every day. And also on the flip side, not allowing yourself to become numb to it where you don't show compassion, uh, even amongst family members because you're like around it all the time. So how, have, how has God worked in you to, to find that balance of, of not taking it on, but also not becoming numb to it? I don't want to make this sound like I'm so wonderful, but because I believe that God called me into this, even though I might have gone kicking and screaming, you know, mm -hmm. in a way, uh, I'm a, but particularly now, now that I've gotten back into it, the people who, the survivors are my age, you know, and that mm -hmm. makes a big difference to me. I've lost mm -hmm. both of my parents. Mm -hmm. And so I understand that if, if, um, you know, when, 85, 90, 92 year old person dies, their, their sons and daughters are my age, yeah. you know, and, and I'm kind of a touchy feely guy now and I don't mind going up and giving them a hug mm -hmm. or put a hand on their back or, you know, mm -hmm. or even at some times I, I might joke with them about something, mm -hmm. uh, because I get to know them, you know, and, and, um, it just, it's made a big difference. Now in my thirties, I didn't have that. It mm -hmm. was just, 
sign here, you know, yeah. and, and and because I work for probably the largest funeral home operation on the west coast of Florida, and so we had like six or seven funeral directors, and a lot of times I might meet with the family, but I might never see them again mm -hmm. because somebody else worked the viewing and somebody else, we had like five different chapels, and I might go someplace else to do something, um, and, and so... Now, because I'm sort of this semi-retired person, that's what my job is, is to go in and, and you know, again, receive a, a, a deceased from someplace and maybe have a chance to talk to the family if they're still there. I work the viewings, I work the, the, the services, and so that the actual funeral home owner can, you know, be kind of in the background and I, because he's young. You know, mm -hmm. he just bought the place from his dad mm -hmm. and who bought the place from his dad. Mm -hmm. And so you've got mm -hmm. a third generation group of people and they know everybody in town. But I can go back in there and, and be that person that anyway, that, that I don't know how to say it, but can do something different than what the owner is going to do. Uh, sure, because, he can be personal in a way that he can. not Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. he could, but but he, you know, he's he's not where I'm mm -hmm. at. Sure, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to put that down. I'm just mm -hmm. saying that there's, it's a different, a whole different atmosphere now for me, just because I understand where you're at, mm -hmm. and I've got kids that are their kids' mm -hmm. age. I mean, you know, so mm -hmm. now you've got sons and daughters that are my age, but their kids are my kids' age. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, you know, would get that too, that there's grandma and grandpa. And, and, and so for me, it's, it's real, it's not fake. Um, and, uh, I don't know that I've ever offended anybody, but, uh, I don't have a problem with if I think that it'd be appropriate to give them, you know, a hug mm -hmm. or to talk to them in a different way. You know, mm -hmm. I might say something to, to like one of the, their children saying, you know, take care of your dad. Mm -hmm. You know, or you know, something like because he just lost his wife of 55 years. Right. You know, what's he going to do? And may say something like that that I would have never thought to say mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. um, and I will generally offer, you know, like, uh, you know, if, if, if I have a chance to meet them at, uh, at the hospital, if they're still waiting or, or at a nursing home or particularly at home, I will generally tell them, may the Lord turn his face towards you mm -hmm. and be gracious to mm -hmm. you and give you peace mm -hmm. because I want them to know, you know, because a lot of times they're no, they aren't at peace, mm -hmm. even though they know mom has been, is, mm -hmm. is dying when she finally does, it's heartbreaking, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then they start saying, oh, I wish you would have this or that, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, not that my words are going to necessarily change anything, mm -hmm. but to let them know that mm -hmm. I, I get it. I, I know where you're at. I've been yeah. there. A timely word in that and a grief right. is That's so what I was about important. To say. Yeah. So important. Absolutely. And allowing the Holy Spirit. And I appreciate your willingness to be obedient and to point the light to Jesus. And so I have a question I'm a little bit curious about. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but as you're reflecting back on kind of your career, have you found any significant differences, because I'm sure you've served both believers and non-believers, um, like families and how they handle the death of a loved one. Uh, is there a significant difference between those who, who trust Jesus, who are Christians, and those who don't? Well, if they are, if you can tell the difference, yes, then there is a difference. You know, there's a lot of people, and, and you all know this, that you just because you go to church or you got a Bible sitting on your nightstand doesn't make mm -hmm. you a Christian. Uh, they may believe in God, but this whole idea of what happens now, mm -hmm. yeah, I, you can you can tell a difference between somebody who has no idea what's going to happen to this particular person. Mm -hmm. Not always, but you know, because again, there's a lot of people out there who believe that all good people go to heaven, right? Mm -hmm. You know. And, mm -hmm. and ministers sell that, That's you know, point. this, yeah. this what, a what a soft gospel mm -hmm. and they, and, uh, and it's not, it's not legitimate. So they can still feel good. Like mm -hmm. we'll see mom and dad mm -hmm. someday mm -hmm. and maybe you will, and maybe you won't. I don't, I'm not judging on whether they're Christians or whether they're right. not Christians, but you can generally tell somebody who truly is, you know, in, mm -hmm. you know, has, is a Christian. It's not how I want to say it, but 
and their kids are. Mm-hmm. You know, and you can tell that by the songs that they want play, mm-hmm. or the if they stand up and they want to have a word of their own. A lot of times, you know, maybe their grandchildren or their or or the children may want to say something at the at the funeral, uh, and you can tell the difference. But then you can also tell the difference of, you know, the the twenty year old that just committed suicide, and the mom is completely lost. Yeah, mm-hmm. you right. know that, and the last thing she wants you to do is talk to her probably about God or anything yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I find that that sometimes if you're in that spot, I've had family members over the years that have lost uh, just a tragic situation. And the last thing they want from your lips is anything about God, mm. even though they probably know in their heart that's true. But don't talk to me about it right now. And so I, I, I could see where you would be like, whoa, you've got to really judge those situations yeah, very you carefully. Really, I- Pray that the Holy Spirit leads you in that right timing and things like that. So last question. So through your career, what do you feel God has taught you through this position, through this job, either about death, life, God, the human condition, anything like that? Is that you truly don't know when you're going to take your last breath. Hmm. You know, there are plenty of, in, in my experience, you could be, you know, you've, kissed your wife goodbye or the wife is and and she never or he never comes home because he's got in a car accident Mm -hmm. you know and you really don't know i mean there's obviously when you're 80 90 years old you've got a pretty good idea but for those people who are 30 40 50 years old and think that they're going to live another 20 years there is no guarantee Mm -hmm. sure you know um i'm uncomfortable saying too much but like you have somebody who's you know driving a motorcycle and a deer t-bones him and and he's done yeah it was never something you planned Mm -hmm. you know life is good and you don't ever come home and then your family gets a phone call yeah from the coroner Mm -hmm. you know so that's the thing that i've 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 had to you know i guess digest is Mm -hmm. that for my kids or my kids kids there is no guarantee that tomorrow you're not going to be here anymore mm-hmm. physically, mm-hmm. you know, and and so you better enjoy the ride mm-hmm. the best you can because you don't really, you just don't know. Yeah. Any one of the four of us never make it home tonight, mm-hmm. you know. There's no guarantee, right? Oh, well, that's a great reminder. Like one, pursue Jesus, right? Because just like. You know, we could take our last breath. Jesus could decide to come back, right, in five minutes. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. That would be amazing. But at the same time, for a lot of people, it's not praise the Lord, hallelujah, amazing. Mm-hmm. It's 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 going to be rough. Yeah. And so pursue Jesus, but also like, like God has given this gift of life, right? He's given this, this amazing gift, and we are to live it uh, in the full. You know, sometimes I think we feel bad about enjoying things. But, you know, God takes pleasure when we enjoy His creation, when we enjoy relationships, when we enjoy the church. And so uh, that's a good word, brother. That's a good word. Man, you are awesome, Greg. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I've, I've learned a lot. I really appreciate you sharing your heart and appreciate all that you do for people who are in a tough spot. Appreciate you, man. Yeah. Thanks for joining us on this special episode with Greg Huffman on Becoming Branches. See you next time.